Okay, so hi everybody, and thank you very much for accepting to review my work, for supervising it, and for just uh, being here today. So I will present to you the work that I did uh, during my master, which consisted uh, in the development of an innovative solution to minimize the uh, radio frequency field inhomogeneities and the energy deposition in ultra high field MRI applications. I was under the supervision of uh, Professor Julian Cohen Haddad and Professor Eva Alonso Ortiz. Uh, so let's go. All right, so I will start by introducing some context. And first, I want to briefly and uh, simply explain how uh, an MRI scanner works. So here you can see a patient lying in a scanner, and uh, this patient in its body has uh, spins. So it's mainly the proton that compose the water molecules in the body. And these spins, they act as magnetic dipoles. So the first thing we do in MRI is to apply a static magnetic field that we call P0 that will orient all these uh, spins in a specific uh, direction, and that will create a net magnetization. Um, so the second step is to apply a radio frequency field that this time we call the B1. And this field will flip the magnetization in the transversal plane. Uh, do you see my, uh, my pointer? Just to make yes. sure. Okay, great. So uh, the spins will be flipped in the yes. transversal direction and they will uh, generate this MR signal that we measure with uh, uh, receive coils. And that's what we're gonna use to, um, re to reconstruct our images. So as you can see here, uh, uh, once we stop applying the B1 field, the, the protons will slowly go back to their equilibrium position along B0. And uh, at some point there will be no more MR signal. So we'll have to start over again if we want to acquire another image. So in this work, I will mainly uh, talk about the B1 field because that's the one I've been uh, working with. So the B1 field is a radio frequency field uh, with two uh, principal components. Uh, it's usually divided between uh, B1 plus and B1 minus. And B1 plus uh, is more related to uh, the, um, the field that flips the spins in the transverse plane, while B1 minus is more uh, about the re-emitted signal uh, that uh, we use to uh, reconstruct the image. So to uh, efficiently flip the spins, uh, the B1 frequency must correspond to the speed of precision that the spins have in the body, which is called the Larmor frequency. And this frequency at which the spins precess is uh, omega naught, and it's, it, it's um, equal to gamma times B0, where B0 is the strength of the main magnetic field, so the scanner's strength. And gamma is the zero magnetic ratio, which is specific to the type of uh, nuclei that we image. So uh, as you can see here, the strength of the armor signal directly depends on the flip angle. So the angle at which the, the spins are flipped in the transverse direction. If uh, you can see here, like with a 90 degree flip angle, the signal is very large and it slowly decays back to the equilibrium position. While with a very small flip angle, the decay is fast and the signal is smaller. So, uh, this flip angle is uh, directly dependent on B1 plus with the uh, with this formula. So if we uh, the, if we have uh, like a, for example a very weak B1 plus, we'll have a small flip angle and then we'll have a small armor signal to reconstruct our image. So just keep in mind that the armor signal uh, depends on B1 plus strength. Okay. So now I will talk about the benefits of uh, performing ultra high field MRI. So uh, ultra high field is uh, when uh, the B0 field is higher than seven Tesla. So usually in clinical applications, the field ranges from 1.5 Tesla to three Teslas. So having a ultra high field allows for a higher signal, a better image resolution and a shorter scan time. So. Uh, really, it's more of a trade-off between these three uh, things. So if you want to only have a higher signal, you may sacrifice the better image resolution or the short scan time, but you can also decide to keep like the same resolution as you will have at 3T, but acquire the image faster. So yeah, you can, you can choose whatever is the most important uh, between these uh, characteristics. And here, I just wanted to show this image uh, from um, literature where you can see that at 3T, 
and that 70, you can recover like much more details uh, on the, the 70 images. So yeah, the, that that uh, emphasizes the, the importance of uh, ultra high field uh, MRI. Uh, but uh, ultra high field MRI are very expensive. I mean, all MRI scanners are very expensive, but these ones are particularly expensive. And there are only about 100 scanners, uh, 70 scanners in the world right now. And uh, I think only one or two in Canada, uh, two. So to flip the magnetization, as I already mentioned, the P1 frequency must be exactly the Lamar frequency, so the precession frequency of the spins in the body. And uh, if we have a um, high B0 field, then we will have a high Lamar frequency and the B1 uh, wavelength will be reduced. So it's, uh, it's reduced according to this formula. And here in water, at 70, it's 12 centimeter, uh, which means that it becomes smaller than most human body parts that we would like to image. And for this reason, we have a homogeneous P1 in the human body at ultra high field. So that's what you can see here. For example, at 1.5 T, it's pretty homogeneous. At three Tesla, it becomes like a bit brighter in the middle, but still quite homogeneous. But at 70, uh, we have a um, strong hotspot in the hotspot in the middle of the brain and a very weak signal, like a very weak B1 plus uh, field on the edges. So the problem with these inhomogeneities is that, as we already mentioned, the MR signal strength depends on the B1 plus strength. So if you have an inhomogeneous B1 plus field, then you will have an inhomogeneous image. So that's what you can see here, where like, we have a very bright uh, image on the edges of the abdomen, but the, the center is dark. And here, for example, there's the region that is completely dark and you cannot see any detail. And like that, that can be a problem when you want uh, like diagnostic information in this particular region. All right, so now I will quickly go through the different uh, methods that can be used to reduce the B1 inhomogeneities in MRI. So you can perform uh, post-processing of the images. You can also use dielectric padding to, um, to uh, improve the penetration penetration of the RF field in the body. Uh, it is called passive shimming. You can work on the pulse design. So the RF pulse uh, design, you can change its, ch its shape to have it more homogeneous. You can perform static B1 plus shimming. So that's what I'm gonna focus on in this work and I will uh, present how, it, how this works later. And you can perform transmit sense, which is kind of a mix between static B1 plus shimming and pulse design. And finally, you can use calibration-free methods uh, with no additional scan time. Okay, so about static B1 plus shimming, uh, I will quickly present how, uh, how this works. So let's say that you wanna image this brain here. You will, uh, you will use what we call the multi-transmit coil. So it's a coil composed of several transmit elements placed all around the um, region of interest. And each one of these transmit elements will have a magnitude and a phase. So it produces a complex uh, radio frequency field. So you can see here, like uh, the, this is the magnitude and this is the phase. And uh, the problem with these complex um, fields is that they will interfere um, with each other. Uh, like, e e because as you know, if two signals are out of phase, in opposite phase at some point, they will cancel each other out. And if they are in uh, the same phase, they will add up. So this results in uh, this uh, inhomogeneous pattern here. And that's what we want to correct. So this is the B1 plus field uh, obtained by, by exciting these eight transmit elements at the same time. Uh, so what do we use to perform B1 plus shimming is uh, the parallel transmission capability of the scanners. So it allows us to send different pulses to each transmit element. So you can see here that all the pulses are the exact same and we have something pretty inhomogeneous. But if we find a set of uh, uh, magnitude and phase values um, that can optimally uh, homogenize the B1 plus field, uh, we can apply them. So now you can see that the, the phase and magnitude is different on each channel. And now we have something much more homogeneous uh, in the brain. So if we just compare very inhomogeneous and homogeneous. So that's what we call B1 plus shimming or sometimes RF shimming. So how can we perform B1 plus shimming? Let's say that I'm a researcher and I want to improve my ultra high field images. Well, the thing is that 
I cannot find any open source tool available to perform B1 press shimming directly at the scanner. Uh, and uh, all research groups that, that do it seem to have their own code and uh, they don't necessarily share it because they, because they simply don't necessarily want to. So that brings us to my research goals, which were to implement uh, an offline B1 plus shimming uh, toolbox with different algorithms. Offline means that we won't be doing that directly on the scanner's console, but on a computer that is uh, on the side in the, uh, in the MRI room. So then I want to include these uh, algorithms in Shining Toolbox, which is uh, an open source software that we developed uh, in Europoly. I uh, will come back to, the, to that later. And finally, I want to perform in vivo tests um, by uh, doing some RF shimmed spinal, spinal, so B1 plus shimmed spinal cord imaging at 70. Okay, so I will briefly present the main challenges uh, that I had to face. So first one is the scan time, because as I already mentioned, MRI scanner are ra rare and expensive. So the scan time is very precious if, if you want to scan a, a lot of patients uh, and to, to be able to di diagnose a lot of patients. So when we do uh, B1 plus shimming, we have the first step, which is the B1 plus mapping. So we want to measure the RF field uh, generated by each transmit element that we have. Then we want to find the optimal shim weight. So the optimal phase and magnitude values that will uh, homogenize our RF field. And finally, we want to apply the shim weight to the scanner and to run uh, another sequence, uh, imaging sequence with, um, with the optimized shim weights. So this implies uh, additional scanning time. And for uh, my uh, B1 plus um, algorithm to be usable on the scanner, uh, it needs to be as fast as possible. So that was one of the main uh, things to keep in mind uh, during the implementation. A second uh, challenge um, related to ultra high field MRI. Gaspar, do you hear me? Yeah. Um, we stopped being able to hear you. Do you mind just pausing oh. while we sort it out? Yep. Okay, so it's clearly the speaker on that computer. Is it an external speaker? I can still hear you what? on my. Oh, did it drop into my? Oh. Yeah, I can still hear you as well. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, they have a problem in the Neuropoly lab. And now we've disconnected on on that computer. Think, uh, yeah, we. Let's let's have a let's let's. Each okay. 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 Uh, sorry about that, Gaspar. You can continue. Okay, uh, so yeah, as I was saying, okay, there's, uh, there's an echo. Okay, so the second main challenge of ultra high field MRI is the heating of the tissue, because um, as you might know, MRI using uses non-ionizing radiations. Yes, Bob, I'm really sorry. Do you mind going back two slides because we missed about two slides? This Just one. Stop. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the main uh, research, re research goals uh, of my project were uh, to implement offline B1 plus shimming algorithms. Offline means that we are going to perform the RF shimming not directly on the scanner's console, but on a laptop uh, in the MRI room. The second goal was to include these algorithms uh, in Shimming Toolbox, which is uh, an open source uh, software that we developed uh, within Neuropoly. And finally, I wanted to test these algorithms in vivo for uh, spinal cord imaging at 7 Tesla. So the main challenge uh, that I had to face was the scan time, because as I already mentioned, uh, MRI scanners are rare and expensive. Yeah, is somebody speaking? Okay, uh, so scan time is very precious because if you want to diagnose a lot of people, you will have to scan them fast. So the main steps of the B1 plus shimming process are the B1 plus mapping, which is the measurements of the different uh, RF fields produced by the transmit elements. Then we have the shim weights optimization. So finding the phase and magnitude value that will homogenize our uh, RF field. And finally, applying the shim weights to the scanner and perform uh, imaging with the optimal shim weights. So this implies additional scanning time. And if we want our B1 shimming solution to be usable on the scanner, we have to make it as fast as possible. So that's, uh, that was the main uh, thing to keep in mind. The second uh, challenge of ultra high field imaging is the heating of the tissue. Uh, 
So as you might know, MRI uses non-ionizing radiations. So unlike radiography, CT or nuclear imaging, which means that it's not uh, directly harmful. It won't ionize your, uh, your cells and the molecules in your body. But uh, still, RF pulses may de deposit energy in the tissues, and this might cause them to hit uh, a bit like a microwave. It's kind of a huge microwave, but less, uh, less powerful, hopefully. Uh, so if we modify the RF distribution by changing our shim weights, then we may produce hotspots, and we, might, uh, we need to, uh, to keep that in mind when we optimize our shim weight so that we avoid this scenario. So to measure the energy deposition, uh, we use a metric that is called the specific absorption rate. It's the same that we use for the cell phones, for example. And uh, it corresponds to the amount of RF power absorbed by the uh, body tissues. So as I said, if we have RF inhomogeneities, we can induce local, local SAR hotspots. So that's what you can hear, you can see here on this figure. So for example, here around the lungs, we have a very high SAR, while we have like very low SAR in the neck. So uh, when we want to control the, the SAR, why we want to control the SAR, it's because SAR uh, scales with B0 square. So at 70, with a B0 of seven Tesla, it's five times uh, more important than at 3T. So that's why it's so challenging at, uh, at seven Tesla. Safety guidelines limits both the local, so local is, for example, uh, the SAR here or the SAR here, and global SAR. Global is the total amount of energy absorbed by the, the body. So it's limited by uh, guidelines, by, by the law. And uh, one way to, uh, to reduce the SAR is to uh, lengthen the, the, the RF pulses. Uh, so this results in a longer scan time, and we would like to avoid that. So if we can uh, just for, uh, keep the SAR in mind when we do our optimization, we might be able to keep our scan time quite short while improving our homogeneity. So the next thing about the SAR is that we cannot directly measure the SAR uh, when we image a, a patient. So we, we uh, determine the SAR values with simulations and uh, these simulations are not patient specific. So we have simulations done with human body models, but they don't exactly um, relate to the actual uh, human being that we will image. So we use safety factors to uh, account for like the modeling errors and the anatomical uh, variability of human beings. All right, so now I will uh, talk about the implementation of uh, my shimming toolbox B1 plus shimming algorithms. So Shimming Toolbox is an open source software that, uh, that is dedicated to MRI field homogenization. So Shimming is the word that we use to, uh, to, um, to talk about homogenization. So the homogenization of the magnetic fields. So it was initially dedicated to perform B0 Shimming. Uh, so uh, homogenization of the main static uh, magnetic field. Uh, but as ultra high field is becoming more popular, we thought that it would be great to include B1 shimming uh, features in shimming toolbox. So shimming toolbox is, uh, is implemented in Python and uh, the shim weights, as I already mentioned, are complex values because we want to find uh, magnitude and phase values that will optimize our field. And uh, in Python, there were no, uh, no efficient library to perform this non-convex optimization problem with complex values. So what I did is just that I, uh, separate the, I separated the real and imaginary components of my shim weights and performed the optimization on this real uh, vector. And that works uh, surprisingly well. So I was really happy with that. Uh, and the optimization process uh, corresponds to finding the, um, uh, like to minimizing a cost function that relates to the B1 plus field heterogeneity. So if it's minimal, then the heterogeneity will be minimal and we will have something homogeneous. Uh, so I implemented uh, four algorithms that cover the most common shimming scenarios. Uh, it was inspired from literature of from uh, open source uh, pieces of code that I could find here and there. So um, the first algorithm is uh, the phase only shimming algorithm. So here I will try to uh, reduce the coefficient of variation of the B1 plus field in the region of interest. So coefficient of variation is a homogeneity metric that is the standard deviation divided by the mean. So 
in phase only shimming, I will simply uh, modify the phase value. So I will find the optimal phase values to send to the different transmit elements to have something homogeneous. The second one is CV reduction. So it's the same principle. I will try to reduce the, the CV. So keep in mind that CV is sigma over mu. Uh, but this time I will not only optimize the phase values, but I will also optimize the magnitude values. So we do a complex optimization that I described before. Um, the next one is the target uh, value. So this time we will target a B1 plus efficiency value that is set by the user by minimizing this magnitude least square problem here. So it's still a complex optimization. And the final one is the SAR efficiency shimming. So this time we don't really focus on the homogeneity, but we mainly want to have a strong B1 plus efficiency compared to our maximum local SAR. So it's useful, for example, when we have a very, very uh, high SAR sequence. So you deposit a lot of energy in the patient and you want to uh, deposit less energy, but still keep a high signal in the region of interest. So now I will uh, compare like the results that I obtained with these different algorithms. So on the left here, you can see the single pulse excitation, which corresponds to when uh, you apply the same, the exact same pulse on uh, all transmit elements. So you can see that it's pretty inhomogeneous. You have very dark regions with no signal uh, in, the, in the brain. Uh, and you can see that the coefficient of variation is 0 0.44. So it's a large coefficient of variation. It's not very homogeneous. The second uh, image here is the CP mode. So it's the circular poly polarization mode. It's the default that, uh, that is used on the scanner. And uh, this circular polarization here is uh, much more homogeneous than uh, the, the single pulse excitation, as you can see here. And the reason is that when we design the CP mode uh, for a specific coil, we take the uh, homogeneity into account. We usually take uh, the homogeneity into account. So they will usually be, uh, be a, bit a bit more homogeneous, but uh, they are not patient specific, so they are not optimal. Finally, you can see here the phase on Ishming, which is the first algorithm that I presented before. And uh, you can see that you would still manage to reduce uh, the, the coefficient of variation. So this one is uh, a bit more homogeneous than the middle one. Uh, I know that it does not really look like it, but yeah, it's more homogeneous. And uh, now I will compare the four algorithms. So I still have my phase on Ishming here. Uh, so you can see here with the CV reduction, that we have uh, um, further reduced the coefficient of variation and we have a mean B1 plus efficiency of 35. So here with the target algorithm, uh, I target 30 nanotesla per volt. So I'm quite uh, close compared to the CV reduction algorithm and I still uh, manage to keep my, uh, I would say, optimal uh, coefficient of variation because on this data set and with eight oh, sorry uh, with eight transmit elements that's the the best uh, homogeneity that i could have with the full uh, region of interest and uh, finally you have the sar efficiency so this time you can see that the cv is not great at all and which is normal because we don't we don't aim at um, at a large at a small C cv sorry we just aim at having a, a large uh, SAR, uh, large B1 plus efficiency while keeping the SAR very low. So that's what we do here. And uh, you can, yeah, I still have the CP mode values uh, for comparison. So just uh, notice that the, this uh, region of interest is very, very large. Like I have the skull, I have the full brain. And usually if you want to shim, you will try to shim over smaller regions. Okay, so how did I do to limit the healing of the tissues? So usually um, when we want to limit the, the SAR deposition, uh, we affect to each 10 gram of tissue uh, matrix that will be used to compute the, the maximum local SAR. And uh, this SAR matrix is determined by, um, by uh, simulations, as I mentioned before, and we will use that during our, our optimization. We have a lot of SAR matrices because we have a lot of uh, 10 gram uh, pieces of tissue in, uh, in our body. So what we do is that we uh, gather these SAR matrices into subgroups. So that's what you can see here, like similar matrices will have the same color and we call these groups virtual observation points. And uh, so on Siemens scanner, uh, something is good. It's that you can find these virtual observation points uh, in a specific file and you can just fetch them and put them on your uh, computer site. 
uh, and you can use them with Shimming Toolbox when you want to constrain your local SAR. So uh, I also uh, use a SAR factor uh, for, uh, to, for my constraint. So the limit maximum SAR will be SAR factor times the maximum SAR local of the phase only shimming. So I will do a phase only shim. I will not touch the magnitude. So I will keep like something similar to the CP mode in terms of uh, SAR deposition should be similar. And then I will just uh, use a SAR factor that gives a bit more uh, freedom to the optimization process. Uh, and if no VOP file is provided by the user, I will simply keep the norm of the shim weight to one. All right. So here you can see the effect of the SAR factor. So for example, if you have a 1.1 SAR factor, so you just uh, exceed the SAR, the SAR of the phase only shimming by uh, 10%. You see that the mean efficiency would be 29 nanotesla per volt. But if you go a bit higher and higher, you will see that your, uh, your B1 plus efficiency will be higher. So we'll have a better signal and you can still keep the same uh, homogeneity with a CV of 0 0.21. So no, uh, another feature that I wanted to have in my uh, code was to the possibility to shim over smaller uh, region of interest and particularly over segmented regions. So uh, when you shim over a small ROI, but you keep the same number of transmit elements, you will have a higher degree of freedom for your homogenization process. So shimming toolbox is compatible with um, external segmentation tools because it's, uh, it's like coded in Python. So you can have it uh, along other, uh, other segmentation tools. We have segmentation tool that we developed at Neuropoly. And uh, here, for example, I used uh, the brain extraction tool, which is developed by uh, Oxford. And uh, you, here you can see that you just keep the brain and you remove the skull out of your region of interest. And uh, here it's with the target uh, algorithm. And you can see that if you remove um, part of the region of interest, you can have something more homogeneous with a reduced coefficient of variation, and you can approximate the target uh, very slightly better in, the, in this case. And if you use a very small ROI, which is uh, for here um, a square in the middle of the brain, so that's something you can do with Shimming Toolbox. And then you can see that we, you will be able to very closely approximate your target uh, value and you will have a very, very small um, heterogeneity. So we, you have a small, uh, a low CV. All right, so the next step, once you have your, um, your shim weights, uh, so these shim weights are computed by shim toolbox and they are returned in a text file. So it's like, it's like this, it's the, your screenshot of the text file. So you will have your magnitude values and your phase values. And you will have to manually input them on the scanner. So that's how we do right now. And it takes time, especially if you have a high number of uh, TX elements, because you will have to type all of these manually. Um, uh, yeah, another uh, thing that um, we developed is uh, the integration of the Shimming Toolbox into a user interface. So we used the FSLI uh, user interface and we implemented Shimming Toolbox as a plugin because it's a uh, it's a popular software for, um, for biomedical imaging. And you can see here that all the Shimming Toolbox features are in this, uh, in this plugin here. And we, you have a B1 plus Shimming in this tab. So you can switch between the different, uh, the different algorithms very easily. And it's much faster than just type, typing the, the CLIs in, uh, in the terminal. So yeah, uh, I'm really happy with what we did with this GUI integration. And also what is great is that you can visualize your uh, 3D data and uh, go across different slices and with different uh, orientations. So that's uh, really nice. All right, so now that I covered the Shining Toolbox implementation, I wanna talk about the in vivo tests for spinal cord imaging. So spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. It is therefore a very important part of the, uh, the body. And uh, if you have like a spinal cord pathologies, it might drastically affect uh, your daily life. If you have, for example, multiple sclerosis, or um, you won't be able to walk after like uh, a uh, very long uh, um, sickness process. So the diagnostic is uh, very important because it can help us to detect the malady, the, the sickness early and to, to um, treat it. So uh, having the ultra high field benefits uh, can 
help improving this diagnostic. So you can see here uh, two images, two GRE images acquired at 3T and at 7T. And I think you can easily understand how uh, it would be easier to detect uh, some, um, some problems on the 7T images, which has a very, very much better resolution than the 3T images, which is very, uh, uh, very low resolution. Uh, so that's why we thought that spinal cord imaging could benefit from uh, B1 plus shimming. So uh, to uh, do our in vivo testing, we had access to a, a 70 Siemens Terra scanner uh, located at McGill and which is the strongest in Canada. And we also were using a spine coil uh, that you can see here that surrounds the head and the thoracic, uh, the, the top thoracic spine of the patients. So this coil was developed uh, by uh, Nibardo at Neuropoly. And uh, here is like our, the, like the schematics of our, our transmit uh, dipoles. So you can see that we have eight transmit elements that, we'll, that we will control to do the uh, RF shimming. And we also have 20, 20 receive loops that will uh, re receive the signal to generate the image. So what we want to control in RF shimming are these eight elements here. So how do we uh, perform shimming with the shimming toolbox uh, tools? So first we acquire anatomical images. Then we acquire the B1 maps. So the B1 distribution that we want to homogenize. We transfer these images from the scanner to the computer. We segment the spinal cord using a spinal cord toolbox that is developed by Neuropoly. We optimize our shim weights with shimming toolbox. We manu manually input these shim weights to the scanner. And finally, we can acquire shimmed anatomical images. So this whole process takes uh, between five and 10 uh, minutes. I think the longest part is the segmentation and the manually uh, input the shim weights to the scanner. Um, okay. So uh, now let's uh, look at some results. So here you can see the results of the, like that's simulated results. That's the, um, the optimization. So when we compute our uh, optimal uh, our optimal shim weights, that's what we would expect uh, to have if like the patient has not moved at all, if we have a perfect uh, sensitivity. So it's it's the, really the results of the shimming. And you can see that the algorithm works very well because we decreased the coefficient of variation by 67%. And uh, we were targeting 15 nanotesla per volt and our mean is 14.98. So I'm really happy with these results. This means that the software works uh, as expected. So if now we look at the anatomical images and how they have been improved. So here you can see uni images. So very highly T1, um, T1 weighted images. And here you can see uh, GRE images that were used to compute the, the uni images. So you can see that, uh, oh yeah, uh, on these images, the spinal cord was manually segmented and I performed a core registration using spinal cord toolbox to better compare uh, similar anatomical uh, regions. Uh, and you can see that uh, on uni images, the coefficient of variation of the intensity has been reduced by 11%. And on GRE images, it has been reduced by 40%. So it's, um, it's very nice to see that it actually works with the in vivo, uh, in vivo tests. And also, uh, I know that it remains a lot of uh, inhomogeneities, especially on the GRE images, but this is mainly due to the received sensitivity of our coil, which is not perfectly homogeneous. So yeah, B1 plus is not the only thing that affects the image homogeneity. But uh, interestingly, you, you can see that we recover signal at the thoracic level. So especially here, and even if you look outside of the spinal cord, we recover signal. So that helps us uh, like uh, get a better advantage of uh, our coil design. So that's uh, also really interesting. So we had some limitation in that study uh, because it was really hard for us to acquire good B1 plus maps. We had uh, most of the time a lot of masking in the spinal cord. And if we want to do RF shimming along the spinal cord, we need to have no masking in it. So for that reason, we could only successfully perform the experiment twice. And we would like to uh, perform that again uh, later to just uh, make sure that we will always get uh, very good results. Uh, so now I will uh, discuss about the different uh, things that I, uh, 
I presented. So first about the Shilling Toolbox implementation, uh, it works uh, exactly as I intended it to. So I'm very happy with the, that part of the project. Uh, it covers most uh, of the common shimming scenarios. I, I, I know that some algorithms would be better suited for, for some research groups, but I cannot cover all very specific um, uh, applications. So I try to be as uh, general as possible uh, to, to make it available to research group with no knowledge in this field. Uh, so far, the code is only fully compatible with Siemens scanner which might be uh, problematic because uh, even if it's the biggest manufacturer, uh, there are a lot of uh, General Electrics and Philips scanner uh, out there. So we would like uh, B1 Shimming to be compatible with these scanners also. So that brings us to the next steps of the project that would be to add the compatibility with other manufacturers uh, to implement dynamic shimming. So not only shimming um, for a few full vol volume with only one set of shim weights, but for example, to shim for each slice uh, individually. So every time we acquire a slice, we have a new set of shim weights. That's something that we do for B0. And uh, finally, we would like to find a way to automatically send the shim weights to the scanner because that would save time uh, and that would make the process um, very seamless to the user. About the spinal cord shimming, uh, the preliminary results are more than satisfying, but we still need more experiments uh, to, to validate them. And uh, I hope at some point we'll be able to acquire good B1 maps uh, every time. Uh, it helps us uh, better exploit the college geometry than the CP mode. So that's also a great feature and that can be useful for other uh, research group to, to compute CP mode or to perform, uh, to perform B1 plus shimming. Uh, and the next steps on that project would be to perform dynamic shimming. So what I said, but so each slice of the spine could really benefit from the very small cross section of the spine on each slice to have something very, very homogeneous with a high degree of freedom and to develop also universal pulses for the spinal cord. So these are calibration free method with no, uh, with no additional scan time. So that would be a great uh, benefit for uh, intrafield spinal cord imaging. So as a conclusion, I uh, successfully implemented a user-friendly open source B1 plus shimming toolbox. Uh, the in vivo tests were successful, even if we still need to reproduce them. And finally, the, we think that I think that the spinal cord imaging at 70 may benefit from the B1 plus shimming. So thank you all, and uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs>